let's start looking through simple regression lines and their simple regression slopes. We can rearrange our model to conceive of things in terms of a simple regression line. So here I've got two predictors, x1 and x2, and their interaction, the product of them. Suppose I was interested in the regression of y on x1. In our, um, in our example, this is a regression of I've life satisfaction on health, where x2 is age is the moderating variable. Well, if I look at this regression equation, it looks like it has a whole bunch of terms, but with respect to x1, let's see, b0 is a constant, doesn't involve x1. b2 times x2 is also a constant with respect to x1. That is, it doesn't involve x1. So I'm going to lump b0 and b2 times x2 together. These are the things that don't involve x1. The other terms do involve x1. I got my b1 multiplied by x1 and b3 multiplied by x1 times x2. These two terms do involve x1. I'm going to lump them together and recognize I can factor out an x1 from each of them and I'm left with b1 plus b3 times x2. So look at the structure here. You can look at this line or this equation as representing a regression line of y on x1. Got y on the left hand side and then a constant, at least with respect to x1, an intercept plus something multiplied by x1, a coefficient or a simple slope multiplied by x1. Of course, in order to find the numbers here, I'm going to need values for the b's and values for x2. Here, I'm plugging in the numbers from our example. b0 was 50.699, b2 was 0.654, b1, 0.349, and b3, 0.027. So in our example, this expression captures the simple intercept regressing y on x1. It is a constant with respect to x1. You've got to tell me x2 in order for me to calculate it. But this expression does not change as a function of x1. This expression here is a simple slope for x1. It's the thing that multiplies x1 in a regression equation. And it is a constant with respect to x1. you got to tell me x2 in order for me to calculate a number here. So it's a function of x2, but not a function of x1. Let's do this a few times. We'll get some practice and see what it communicates. Using this simple regression line or formula, we can compute the simple slope of y on x1 at any value we choose of x2. So now we got to choose some values for x2. Um, our text uh, does a nice job of kind of uh, working through the story, and the general practice is pick a few representative values that are either important to you or that roughly cover much of the distribution. And if you don't have anything that is particularly compelling, pretty standard practice is to compute things at the mean of x2, one standard deviation above the mean of x2, and one standard deviation below the mean of x2. So we'll do this, and I will do the easy one, the mean of x2. The mean of x2 is 40.91. But when I center x2, what is the mean of the centered variable? Zero. That's what centering accomplishes for us. The standard deviation of x2 is 8.32, and centering does not affect that. So I'm going to calculate x2 at three different values, a low, medium, and high value. The medium value is right at the mean. 
Well, what's the value of the centered uh, x2 at the mean? Zero. What's the low value? I'm going to go one standard deviation below the mean on x2. Well, that's the mean. And then go down one standard deviation. That takes me to negative 8.32. The high value is start at the mean and go up one standard deviation. That takes me to positive 8.32. Okay. So I'm going to plug some in. Plug in these chosen values for x2 into the simple regression um, formula. So here's my simple regression formula. This is that simple intercept and simple slope. I'm going to plug in a value of x2. Starting with the mean, the value of x2 at the mean once centered is 0. 0 times anything is 0. The simple intercept is just 50.699. How about the slope? Plugging in a 0 for x2 knocks out this term, and I'm just left with 0.349. So that's interesting. Plugging in a value for the mean of x2 yields just the regular old intercept and the regular old uh, slope for x1. All the things that involve x2 just drop out. What this reveals to us is that the simple slope for the regression of y on x1 at the mean of x2 is just the regular old regression coefficient b1. In this case, that was a value of 0.349 for our predictor help in the full model. So what we're saying is, what is the slope for health as a predictor at the mean of age, that is when uh, age has a mean of, uh, at the mean, so a center value of zero, it's 0.349. Similarly, the partial regression coefficient for age in the full model, B2, was 0.654. That's the slope of the regression of life satisfaction or age at the mean value of health. So I did the easy one, where plugging in zero, multiplying by zero, things drop out. Good, now you do the hard ones. Step through the calculation, take a few minutes, step through the calculations, plugging in a value of one standard deviation above the mean for x2, 8.32, and one standard deviation below the mean, negative 8.32, and see what you get. Take a few minutes, work with a neighbor if you'd like. Thank <laughs> you. 
Like most folks seem to be working at this, maybe rounding into some answers. Let's look at it together. Here is what I got when I did it. Going one standard deviation below the mean on X2, that would be a centered value of negative 8.32. Plugging in negative 8.32 here times 0.654, added to 50.699, took me to 45.258. And plugging in uh, negative 8.32, there's x2 over there, times 0.027, added to 0.349, took me to a 0.124. There we go. Uh, and then for one standard deviation above the mean of x2, plugging in a value of 8.32, plugging in here 8.32 times 0.654 plus 50.699, 56.140. 8.32 times 0.027 plus 0.349 takes me to uh, 0.574. Okay. So we've now done this three times. We said if you are one standard deviation below the mean on X2, this is the simple regression line for Y relating to X1. If you're at the mean of x2, this is the simple regression line for y relating to x1. And if you're one standard deviation above the mean on x2, this is the regression line relating y to x1. So what is the regression line relating y to x1? What is the slope for x1 in this situation? What's the answer? It depends. That's the meaning of an interaction. It depends. The relationship between y and x1 changes or depends on x2. That's the point of an interaction. This is the key point. Do we have any thoughts or questions about it? We can visualize some of these things. Here's a pretty simple uh, graphical representation. I've just drawn those three lines. So here along the horizontal axis is the predictor x1 uh, centered. And here is the uh, vertical axis is the predicted value of uh, life satisfaction. And I have three lines. The line in green is at the mean of x2. The line in blue is one standard deviation below the mean of x2. And the line in tan gold something is one standard deviation above the mean on x2. So what is the relationship between y, life satisfaction, and health? It depends. This is what it is for people of average age in the data set. This is what it is for people who are older in the data set. This is for people who are one standard deviation below the mean on the data set. What you can see is that from one standard deviation below to being at, 
to being one standard deviation above the mean, the slope of the line is getting bigger. Numerically, that's here. From one standard deviation below the mean to at the mean to one standard deviation above the mean, the slope is literally getting bigger. So as people get older, what we see is the slope or the relationship between the outcome, life satisfaction, and the predictor health gets stronger. Interpreting interactions can be tricky. Um, I like to use graphs. I'll make myself that little graph, plot those lines, and say what is happening as x2 gets from below the mean to at the mean to above, what's the change in the line really like? Um, all that really is captured by the interaction term in the model, that is the coefficient b3. And that value was 0.027 in our data set. So what we can conclude is that the slope of the relationship between life satisfaction and health is greater for older adults than younger adults. We can infer that the slope of the relationship between health and life satisfaction is stronger, greater, for older adults. The coefficient there was 0.027, meaning that the slope of the regression of life satisfaction on health changes or differs by 0.027 units for every one point or one unit difference in age. So as age goes up by one, in this case one year older, the slope between life satisfaction and health goes up by 0.027. Yeah? So is there a way to do an exploratory analysis to look for an interaction, or do we have to be very intentional about like adding that into the model? So the question is, is there a way to do a kind of exploratory analysis, or do we have to kind of come to it, come to regression with the idea? Uh, there are techniques for exploring in that way, um, kind of, all right, I have a whole bunch of predictors, and find if there are any interactions among them. Uh, in regression analyses, I don't tend to recommend those. As we will talk about at some point in our course when we talk about things like hierarchical modeling, putting in extra predictors, there are more exploratory versions of that. Um, historically, those have not tended to perform very well in terms of cross-validation, meaning you find something in this data set, but it, it doesn't show up again in later data sets. We'll talk a little bit about sort of the growth of more machine learning and analytic type exploratory techniques. I think there's a time and a place for them. Uh, but from within the traditional regression paradigm, the idea is that we come to the model with these hypotheses and say, I want to investigate the interaction between age um, um, and health on life satisfaction. Rather than, I didn't have any idea and I let the computer or program suggest it to me. So if we're looking at like a scatter plot, could we like maybe make assumptions based on that? Like, do you have any examples of what it would look like? It's really tricky to look at a scatter plot and do that because um, most of our scatter plots are you know, two dimensional. So we have one predictor and the outcome. It is, I can't say, well, if this scatter plot looks like this and this one looks like this, then that is suggestive of an interaction. Uh, as far as, I think that's very complicated to try to distill down into rules or guidelines. Um, no, mo most of the time our, our stories of interactions come from theory that says, sure, health is related to life satisfaction, but it's probably more critical for older adults than younger adults. That's an interaction hypothesis. And what would be like the consequences if we missed the interaction? There was one. Yeah, so if we worked with our model that does not include an interaction, when in fact there's really one in the data, then we still have our linear regression model with our multiple predictors, and the results there are basically averaging over the variation. 
So we have variation here. The slope is changing. That's the whole point of an interaction. Thus, the relationship between y on x1 is changing. If we don't investigate that, that is we're not attuned to finding it, and we just run regular old regression, the coefficients we get basically average over that variability. We don't, we're not sensitive to it. It's still a, an execution of regression that we would interpret in the usual way, which is holding all else constant, a one point difference in, say, health, we would expect this difference in life satisfaction. That's still true. But then there's someone at the back of the room who says, don't hold it constant. It's going to change as age varies. Yeah? Um, are there any um, like restrictions or things we need to think about um, when it comes to the correlation between um, that x2 or that moderator variable and the outcome or the other predictor? Like, is it ideal that they're not correlated, or is it ideal that they're not strongly correlated, or it doesn't matter? No, it doesn't matter. Um, generally, we tend to include predictors that seem on the surface to have some correlation with the outcome. So if x2 was totally uncorrelated with y, a lot of people would say, well, why even bother pursuing it at all? Um, in terms of salience for an interaction, I, I wouldn't do that. If you have a theoretical interest, I'd say put it in as a predictor, form the interaction term you're interested in, and investigate it. Um, but no, I wouldn't say, well, it's better when there's this kind of correlation or this kind of pattern. And I certainly don't like things that say, well, if the correlation is less than this, you can ignore it or something like that. Or the correlation must be in this range in order to investigate a relationship or include it as a predictor. Uh, that can lead to a lot of trouble. Other questions? Yeah? Did we um, like calculate the, the tolerance and the CIF to, to look at multi multicollinearity once we centered that? Like, you, did we, like, one can do that, um, certainly. Um, and I don't think we had it in the table and the results. You can certainly do that. It's going to be much lower okay. than that was the point on center. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Centering predictors is the dominant way of reducing collinearity. Yeah. So it's going to have that effect essentially every time. Here's how I might write this up in a few um, short paragraphs. Um, I'd start by saying regression analyses conducted on a sample of 100 subjects to investigate uh, utility of predicting life satisfaction. Here's some summary statistics for the outcome. Using a measure uh, of health as a predictor, summary statistics, age measured in year of summary statistics. And now, pertinent to what we've been discussing, to examine the potential interaction between health and age, the predictors were centered and a product term was employed. Uh, the model accounted for a total of 21% of the variance and life satisfaction. Uh, R squared, there's the F statistic, usual stuff. I could report the coefficients for each of the predictors, health, age, and the coefficient for the interaction term. And note that the interaction explained an additional 3% of the variance of life satisfaction above and beyond health and age. The interaction term indicates that viewed in terms of the regression of life satisfaction on health, this relationship is stronger for older adults. For example, the simple slopes for life satisfaction on health, one standard deviation below the mean, at the mean, and above the mean on age are 0 0.12, 0 0.35, and 0 0.57 respectively. To illustrate, I can show you that plot of the, the different lines representing here's the situation at the mean of x2, here's the situation one standard deviation below the mean of x2, and so on. Yeah. Um, so essentially, it's not super helpful to interpret the individual slopes on their own, or even the interaction slope on its own. It's more like it gives us more information to interpret and look at the simple slope. Yeah, there's a few parts to that. I'll try to go in reverse order. Uh, for the most part, once we pursue an interaction, as we'll talk about, at sort of the highest order effect. We got x1, 
we got x2, and we have the product of x1 and x2. Um, it's tricky to in interpret the main effects, the, the coefficient for x1, when there is an interaction. And some people say it has no meaning once you determine there is an interaction. That's too far. It has a meaning. The coefficient for the first predictor health, 0.35, again, that's essentially saying like at the mean of x2, so at an average value of the other predictors, what's the relationship? What the coefficient for the interaction, uh, the 0.03 says is, look, as x2 moves by one unit, how much does the slope vary? So once you're saying the slope is changing, just looking at one kind of overall at the average doesn't tell the whole story. There's more to it, and that's what the interaction conveys. Um, the other question was, so that was about do we look at the, the other slopes besides the interaction, right? Yeah, interpreting them, but I think we answered that along with it. Right? Okay. So if, if we were going to interpret, like, let's say this so for health, we're interpreting it specifically at the mean of life satisfaction. Yeah, that's what it is in this case. But our story is that, and it changes as a function of x2, so I got to tell you that more complete story. There are additional analyses that you might consider, and occasionally I see people do this, though not all that often in a regression. Uh, you might say something like, well, wait a minute, if I have these different regressions of y on x1 at different values of x2, well, I could ask, is the simple slope statistically significantly different from zero at any point on x2? Or what are the points along x2? for which the simple slope of y on x1 is statistically significantly different than zero. Or do the slopes for any two values at different values of x2, are they statistically significantly different from one another? There's a whole bit of statistical machinery that you can learn that our book does a, a decent job of uh, covering it, um, and there are other uh, texts that do how to do this, but I almost never see anyone investigate this, frankly. If they examine an interaction and they say, all right, I think an interaction is there and operative, I'm going to tell you about that interaction and try to get an understanding of the data, not do these further statistical significance tests of simple slopes. But it can be done. Yeah? Is it possible for a product then to not be statistically significant, but it's maybe one or two? Is it possible for the interaction term not to be statistically significant, but if we go ahead and compute different simple slopes that they would be different? Say different. It's possible. Uh, let me go back to uh, our results here. Um, we put in values that are one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation above the mean. If I were to go 10 standard deviations below the mean and 10 standard deviations above the mean, that would be hugely different. So even if the interaction effect was not statistically significant, if literally in the sample data it's something other than zero, you can just pick points far enough away that it's going to show up as different. I tend not to see people pursue this at all. The key uh, inference or the key kind of result that people look at is, um, uh, sorry, where is it? The key inference that people want to make is about that interaction term. And if I say, all right, I've estimated it, and I'm judging its statistical significance, and I conclude that there is an interaction, that's usually the limit of all kind of statistical significance tests. If this is not statistically significant, or we say, I don't think there's really an effect there, or it may be, but there's a teeny tiny effect that doesn't make much of a difference in terms of explaining variability, then I don't ever see anybody pursue simple slopes after that. This is sort of like, do we move forward or not? In this case, we said, yeah, let's move forward. 
let's come up with the simple slopes at different values of x2. Let's compute them, let's look at them, we'll see how they vary. If it wasn't significant, the coefficient b3, we, we wouldn't do any of this. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yes? I'm still just a little confused on why um, centering all the terms of the beam alleviates the multicollinearity between the interactive curve and the predictors. Yeah, conceptually, it it doesn't alleviate all of the collinearity because as our central point was, the product term is literally made up of the two ingredients. So it's going to be related to it. Why it helps, you can think about conceptually as centering relocates the mean to be zero. In our age variable, in our um, health variable, the, the means are above zero. So we are recentering so that the means are zero. The means are zero, we're going to have positives and negatives that quite literally balance each other out. Right? That's how we get a mean of zero. What that means is when we take the product term, we're going to have more things that essentially cancel each other out or reduce the, the association. So in terms of the, the multiplication to create a product, when we had age and health and all those numbers were positive, means were above zero, it yields some association, covariance. Shifting it to have a different mean, we're going to capitalize more on the pluses and minuses, knocking each other out. Yeah. 